Good morning. Glad to see so many of you could make it this morning. Um, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of guests coming in and out of the room as the morning progresses. Uh, but we wanted to get started as close to on time as possible. Uh, the, I wanted to say the House of Re Representatives welcomes you to the final presentations for our legislative fall class of 2012. My name is Ray Whitaker. I'm the program's coordinator for the House of Representatives and in association with the Bipartisan Management Committee and the Office of the Chief Clerk uh, who sponsored this program. We thank you for coming. The Legislative Fellowship Program since 1982 has provided and continues to provide a short, in-depth course on how state government works. The hands-on experience our fellows have received in the House of Representatives is hard-pressed to be duplicated in classrooms or through textbooks. Uh, I'm sure with simple math you can determine uh, since our program was set up in 1982, it is now 2012, so that marks our 30th anniversary class, this fall class of 2012. Uh, and to date we have approximately over 350 students who have taken part in this program. Uh, we are extremely proud of those statistics and numbers and uh, we're even more proud to say that many of our students continue to find employment in and around state government as well as proceed on to additional schooling. The five students selected to be fellows this semester come from uh, or attend three different colleges and universities in Pennsylvania. What we have tried to do is try to promote their interest in state government and politics and give them the tools to provide something real and useful for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We hope they can use this experience as a complement to their, to their education to achieve their goals. The students have worked throughout this semester with seasoned staff of government and policy. For the past 13 weeks, the fellows have worked tirelessly on drafting bills and resolutions, letters and memos to constituents, and numerous hours of policy research. They have attended weekly, weekly BMC workshops and also have observed numerous meetings and hearings as well as house session in person. They have had the opportunity to see state government up close and personal. This is a special day for our fellows because it marks the end of an intense program. The final assignment, which you'll see today in the program, is to develop a piece of legislation from inception of an idea through possible introduction as a bill. That means taking an idea, researching it, writing it, revising it, and meeting with our legislative attorneys to create a bill that together with an analysis will be printed and reintroduced to you today. Uh, all in front of you there are copies of our bill books and uh, contained in those are the students' legislation so you can read through those as they are presenting. This morning the students will present their legislation to you as an oral presentation. When each fellow has finished his or her formal remarks we will open the floor for questioning. You are encouraged to participate in this process by asking questions of each student on their legislative idea. Each fellow is prepared to, to defend his bill. At least I hope so. If you have a question, please make your way to one of the microphones placed around the room. We have four of them around the tables. Um, since we are recording this, uh, we'd like to hear your questions, and the only way to hear those questions is if you ask it or from the microphone. So please, please do so. And I ask you to be clear and concise with your questioning, and please respect the various viewpoints around the room. Now, if you indulge me, I'd like to go through a few thank yous. First, I'd like to thank the families, advisors, and professors that are with us here today. Thank you for your encouragement and direction of these students for allowing them to take part in our program. I want to thank the outstanding speakers who participated in our weekly workshops. They have shared their experience and enthusiasm for government with and with the students and many of them continue to come back each and every semester. And I want to thank, extend a big thank you to them. They are also listed in your program. Uh, and I want you to take note of the vast array of presenters we have in the program. I would also like to extend our thanks to our former fellows, some of which are here today. Uh, to our chairman and supervisors of our committees and our leadership offices, um, our chief clerk, Tony Barbush, uh, for all their time, energy, direction, and dedication to this program. We certainly could not have this program without your continued support. At this time, I'd like to introduce the legislative fellows in order of their presentation. Um, and if their supervisors are here, I'd like them to stand for recognition as well. Uh, we're going to go a little bit out of order of what's addressed in your programs. Uh, we made a slight last minute change. Uh, so first presenting today we would have Nick Horn. Nick's a student from Temple University. He is assigned to the Democratic Transportation Committee under Representative Mike McGeehan and his supervisors. Oh, sorry, I read that through. Uh, Dan, I knew I was going to make that mistake. Nick's, Nick does go to Temple, uh, but he was assigned to the uh, Veterans Affairs Emergency Preparedness Committee uh, under Representative Steve Barrar and his supervisor Rick O'Leary. Next we have Antoine Tate. Antoine's a student from Penn State Harrisburg. He was assigned to the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus under Representative Ron Waters. His supervisor was Danielle Bowers. 
Next, we have Kevin Martin. Kevin's a student from Millersville University. He was assigned to the Democratic Gaming Oversight Committee under Representative Rosita Youngblood. His supervisor is Bill Thomas. Then we have Daniel Reinert. Daniel's a student from Temple University as well. Uh, assigned to the Democratic Transportation Committee under Representative Mike McGeehan. His supervisor is Meredith Bajika. And Karan Banks. Mr. Banks is a student from Penn State Harrisburg. He was assigned to the Office of the Minority Whip under Representative Mike Hanna. His supervisor is Angel Angela Stalnecker. And with that, I'd like to reintroduce our first speaker, who is Mr. Nick Horn. And his original legislation is to amend the state lottery law to provide for an instant lottery game to benefit Pennsylvania's veterans. Thank you, Ray. Thank you all for being here today. I'd like to thank everyone who has helped me throughout my time as a fellow, especially Rick O'Leary and Sean Harris, as well as Chairman Barrar and the rest of the committee. Additionally, I'd like to thank the BMC program and the Office of the Chief Clerk. And finally, thank you, Ray Whitaker, for facilitating this program. I'd like to begin by providing a little background information on this legislation, and then I'll just dive into describing what it does. The idea for this bill was derived from a resolution adopted by the American Legion, which if you're not familiar is a prominent veteran service organization. In this resolution, it was suggested that legislation be adopted to designate a portion of lottery proceeds to go to veterans programs. At this point, I was not sold on the idea as I knew that lottery proceeds already go to a good cause, which is benefiting older Pennsylvanians every day. My first step was to go through the numbers. I truly was shocked to find the lottery generated over $3 billion in sales last fiscal year, and of that, over $1 billion goes to the older Pennsylvanian services. Not only is this figure impressive, but it becomes even more so when one looks at the past three years and sees that net sales of the lottery has grown 12.7 percent from 2009 to 2012. This is in one of the toughest economic times we've ever experienced. Now, I'm not suggesting these services shouldn't be available to older Pennsylvanians. I'm only suggesting that when dealing with every other government service, including education and transportation, there's a process of analysis and compromise to determine annual funding levels. Yet this process is not applied to the older Pennsylvania services the lottery provides for, which has the potential to grow without limit. To illustrate, the lottery profit grew by over 100 million from 2011 to 2012. At the same time, the Department of Environmental Protection was appropriated 12 million less than the previous budget, the Department of Health 37 million less, the Higher Education Assistance Agency, $37 million less, and the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, $7.5 million less. As a total, this is a decrease in appropriations of about $93 million, while the lottery programs increased by over $100 million. So you see there's an inverse relationship between the older Pennsylvania benefits, mainly administered by the Department of Aging, and other vital services which must rely on taxpayer contribution to the general fund. As a result of this research, I was resolved that legislation to delegate a portion of lottery proceeds uh, to veterans would be feasible and fitting. I believe everyone in this room would agree that we have an obligation to assist those who have put their lives on the line to protect and serve this commonwealth and this country. Pennsylvania has a population of about 12 and a half million, of which close to 1 million are veterans. Needs for veteran services is in great demand now more than in past years due to the age of the veterans population and also due to the growing problems facing our men and women returning from hostile regions and countries around the world. Unfortunately, post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injuries are highly prevalent among returning soldiers. It's not that they weren't prevalent in the veterans of past wars as well. 
It's just that they weren't recognized and treated. Nearly 37% of veterans treated for the first time at VA hospitals between 2002 and 2008 suffered from mental health problems. Of those 303,000 veterans, nearly 22% suffered from post-traumatic stress and 17% with depression. It is for these reasons I knew I wanted to tackle this issue and present a feasible solution. I looked to other states that have created veterans lotteries, particularly Texas, which has a lottery structure that mirrors our own, both in sales and in games offered. Texas and many other states have taken the approach of creating a designated instant ticket, also known as a scratch off, the proceeds of which to benefit veterans. This seemed to be the best practice, especially because the instant ticket games are the fastest growing trend in our lottery. In the past decade, instant ticket sales have gone from being 37.3% of net lottery sales to over 61% of net sales. When faced with a growing market, the only way to sustain and continue growth is to innovate and expand the product offerings. In fact, the lottery's website states that success in recent years is due in large part to having one of the most diverse game portfolios in the country and that it continues to grow the retailer base. Therefore, creating a new instant ticket can only help to continue to grow the retailer base and further diversify the game portfolio. This was the approach I took. The final question was, where do I place the proceeds? I had no desire to create a new veterans program, as many of the ones established are already underfunded. I decided the best solution was to place the funding in a DMVA administered account known as the Veterans Trust Fund. I then decided the program I'd like to fund is the Veterans Service Officer Grant Program. This program provides money to accredited VSOs so that they can assist veterans with their federal VA claims with the goal of increasing veterans' participation and receipt of available federal benefits. This is vital because every dollar secured in federal benefits reduces reliance on state benefit programs. Now I'd like to present the overview of this legislation and follow up with any questions you may have. This bill amends the state lottery law and establishes an instant lottery game to benefit veterans. In doing so, the Secretary of Revenue is authorized to appropriate monies received from this dedicated game to go to veterans outreach services. The game shall be operated continuously and the theme or design shall change regularly to ensure the game remains competitive. The game will be marketed and advertised in a manner intended to inform the public that the game tickets are available for purchase and the proceeds go to fund veterans programs in the Commonwealth. The funds are to be transferred on April 30th of each year to the Veterans Trust Fund and placed in a newly restricted account known as the Veterans Outreach Services Fund. This account will be administered by the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs for the implementation of the Veterans Service Officer Grant Program. It is very important to explain why I chose the VSO Grant Program. Concern exists that this legislation would take away money from older Pennsylvanians. I'd like to comment on that. This is a complicated issue which I have spent much time researching. First, I will explain the quantitative data I have from other states. Texas, upon implementing their veteran scratch off ticket, saw an increase of over 50 million in monies transferred to programs the following fiscal year. Of this, about 7 million was transferred to the veterans programs. So the end result is an increase of 43 million to the other programs. In Illinois, I saw similar results. A veteran scratch off ticket was created in 2006. Between 2005 and 2006, the transfers to the Common School Fund, which is the benevolent fund for their lottery, increased by over 22 million at the same time as the veterans ticket was added. In Iowa, Legislation to operate two instant ticket games and two pool tab tickets were passed in 2008 and fully implemented in 2009. The transfers to the Iowa General Fund increased by over 1.2 million the year the veterans ticket was implemented. So those are the numbers 
but I'd like to explain the dynamic impact of this legislation on the older Pennsylvania services funding. As I mentioned earlier, Pennsylvania has a veterans population of close to 1 million. Of those, according to 2011 census estimates, over 465,000 are 65 and older. Additionally, veterans 55 and older amount to 689,000, or about 72% of the entire veterans population. This means that many of the veterans are older Pennsylvanians, or will soon be older Pennsylvanians. Now, one might say that this means many of our veterans are covered under the umbrella of services the lottery provides for. But the same individuals are also covered under the umbrella of federal VA benefits. The intent of this legislation is to assist veterans with their federal VA claims packets, ensuring they receive the benefits they have earned. As a consequence, veterans who may have been receiving assistance from the Commonwealth will now be receiving the federal benefits for which they have earned by their service to their country. This will not only free up more monies for non-veteran older Pennsylvanians, but will lead to more money being brought into the Commonwealth and more sales tax potential from the use of these monies. It is important to note that as veterans increase in age, their potential VA compensation rating increase, increases as service-related injuries worsen, meaning those likely to benefit from this program are older Pennsylvanians. Additionally, and this is a very important point, it is not unprecedented for programs funded by our lottery to benefit those under 65. This is a fact many do not realize. The property tax and rent rebate program provides relief to not only those over 65, but also widows or widowers 50 years of age or older and the permanently disabled 18 years of age or older. In 2010, the amount of rebates from this fund to those who are not 65 and older amounted to over 96.2 million. This accounts for about 34% of the total rebates given out by this program in 2010. I cannot reiterate this enough. 34% of the funds in this program, one of the major lottery programs, were distributed to benefit those who are not older Pennsylvanians. Another program, pre-admission assessment, which screens applicants for nursing facility placement, is also provided for applicants 18 years of age or older. So as you can see, it's really not the case that the lottery solely benefits those 65 and older. I will now answer any questions you may have. The, there's a report out by the Legislative Budget and Finance Committee um, about the future of lottery services. And the PACE program is actually seeing a reduction in cost due to Medicare Part D as well as the Affordable Care Act. Um, I believe by 2020 they predict that um, they will have saved $760 million in the next decade or so. how many veterans do not seek federal funding because they don't know how that these programs will help? I don't have a percentage of that. Um, what I can say it, and included in my bill analysis, um, there, are, there are programs like um, there's, I believe it's life insurance. Um, there's about 30 million sitting in the federal coffers that probably will never be given out because um, the World War II veterans never even applied for their life insurance that they signed up for. And in, in addition to that, the, a report by the Adjutant General of the DMVA explains that on average veterans who 
receive assistance from an accredited veteran service officer receive twice as much as, as those who apply on their own? Anyone else? Yes, sir. In uh, some of the other states that you were looking at, uh, did they see a reduction in the other sales of particular lottery tickets compared to those that are designated for veterans? Um, would people, would there be competition between the specific lottery tickets that were being sold? Would people, would that, would that come into play and reduce the amount of money going for the tickets that are slated for senior programs? Okay, well, what I found was that overall, the monies transferred to the benevolent purposes such as, um, for Texas, all their money goes to education, and then they implemented this veterans ticket. The next year, they still saw an increase of 43 million transferred um, to the education fund, and I found that in Iowa and Illinois as well. And it's important to point out that this, this doesn't have, um, it's, it's a dynamic impact. It's not a zero sum impact where because we're having a veterans ticket, we're taking away from older Pennsylvanians because there's, there's multiple facets to it, um, which I tried to lay out that we're, by assisting our veterans receive money from the federal government, we're reducing reliance on state programs therefore freeing up more money for our non-veteran older Pennsylvania population. Any more questions? Good. Our next presenter is Mr. Antoine Tate and his bill amends Title 23, which is domestic relations, to include additional crimes under the current law that, that denies employment for pr prospective adoptive parents and foster parents, as well as ensuring a fair process by reducing penalties of certain crimes for offenders who can apply for adoption and foster care. Hello, everyone. Once again, my name is Antoine Tate. I attend Pennsylvania State University Harrisburg campus. My major is communications. I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., and it is truly an honor to stand before you all today. Now, before I begin my presentation, there are a few people that I would love to thank because they contributed to my BMC experience, but also my experience as a man, and for that, I thank you all. First, I want to thank my family, who unfortunately could not come out today because I didn't invite them because it's kind of a long drive. Uh, but I did invite my family who are in Harrisburg, which is my good brothers from the fraternity Cap Officer. Thank y'all for coming out. Um, I definitely want to say thank you to the interns of the BMC program because we had a blast. Whenever we met up, had lunch, it's always a story to tell. Some of the craziest things happened, whether we, whether we were jaywalking across the street or eating rocks that was in our food or tripping down the stairs. It was always a funny story. Uh, so for that, I want to thank you all for being a part of the BMC fraternity. Um, I definitely have to thank the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, uh, which is where I worked. And imagine me saying Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus on the phone every time it rang. That's like a tongue twister. Um, but I definitely want to thank my supervisor, Daniel Barros, the staff members, Akila Logan, April James, Neil DeLamasi Jenkins, Julianne Woloske, Wendy Highgood, and of, course, and of course, Representative Ronald G. Waters, who allowed me to work in his office. I must thank the third floor. I must thank the transportation committee and the gaming committee because although they were not, they were not the committee I was a part of, they were like family. They allowed me to take all their coffee, eat some of their snacks, and just engage in good conversation. I have to thank Dr. Carol Nakemius, who uh, actually introduced the program to me. I have to thank my advisor, Professor Catherine McCormick, who kept me up to date, who, who I kept up to date as far as the program, had to write journals, et cetera. Um, and I have to thank the chief clerk, Tony Barbush, who actually, when I talked to him, he stopped any nerves that I had because he told me this is an, a learning experience. Just go with the flow, present the ideas, your legislation. If something goes wrong, you learn from it. Um, and also the other former fellows who came to the sessions and told us you know, their experience and helped us. I have to thank the legislative reference borough, attorneys Jim Walsh and Bob Zeck. 
they allowed me to do like a complete 180 in terms of my legislation. They smoothed it out, and I'm very proud of what I came up with. And of course, I have to thank Ray Whitaker, our supervisor for the BMC program, who kept us up to date with all the sessions, who kept us on our feet, and who also was kind of like the dad, like the dad of the program. So thank you, Dad. Um, now, in terms of my legislation, my legislation is about amending section 6344, subsection C of Title 23, Domestic Relations of the Pennsylvania Consolidated Statutes to include additional crimes under the current law that denies employment for prospective, adoptive, and foster parents. In addition, the amendment ensures a fair process by reducing the penalties of certain crimes and providing an allotted time frame from five to 10 years after the offense before offenders can apply for adoption and foster care. Now, I wanna talk about how I actually got to my legislation because where I started and where I am now is completely different. Um, coming to the program, I had no idea what my legislation would be about. Um, I was a little nervous, so I asked for some suggestions. And like anyone my age, I went to social network. I Facebook, I tweeted, I Instagram, I LinkedIn, I even MySpace to get some suggestions as to what I should talk about. And some people suggested domestic violence, traffic law violations, but it was one particular topic that I found very interesting, and that was protecting children from child abuse. Now, I am a student at Penn State University, so when I heard the idea of protection from well, uh, child abuse, I thought about the infamous Sandusky case. It was an embarrassing time for Penn State. It was an embarrassing time for myself. It impacted me, the university, but it also impacted Penn State, I mean, Pennsylvania, uh, the state, because all eyes were on us to see how we were going to treat the situation. So, and then we also had to think, you know, who are we going to allow around our children? So as I continue forward with my uh, research, my other suggestion, another suggestion was presented that revolved around protecting children. And that was catching PFA. So that's kind of how I started in terms of my legislation. It was catching protection from abuse charges. People who got those charges, it wasn't uh, dispersed locally. So if someone was in Harrisburg and they moved to Pittsburgh and caught a PFA in one place and tried to adopt a child, it wouldn't get caught. Now, as I did more research, I realized how confusing that was. Um, and I decided not to do it because if I did it today, it may be difficult to explain. But because I did research for the PFA, I found a document that talked about criminal background checks that had all 50 states. And it said uh, all the requirements of what you have to go through in order to adopt a child and the background checks. So from there, I looked at Pennsylvania's, and I must say that I was disappointed with the requirements that, that they had listed because some criminal offenses were missing and some were unfair. So as a result, I chose to change my idea and focus on section 63 of Title 23, information relating to prospective child care personnel. So I'm, right now I'm going to give you an overview of the entire section, and then I'm going to focus on the subsection of that section, if that makes sense. So the overview of section 6344, it's also about the requirements, including background checks and central register checks if you uh, were a perpetrator of child abuse. It goes over the grounds of denying employment, it talks about some of the criteria that you need for foster care and adoption, such as are you able to take care of the child? Um, will you treat them as an equal as your own child? Um, are you emotionally and mentally stable? And you must work well with the agency. Um, that's just a brief overview of what the entire section is. Now I want to get down to the entire subsection, which is my legislation and my changes. So as I previously stated, I want to talk about the grounds of denying employment when looking into an applicant. In this subsection C, there are three sections. In section one, it states that in no case shall an administrator hire an applicant where the applicant has been found guilty in the central register as a perpetrator of child abuse as well as a school employee committed within a five year period. In section two, it states, in no case shall an administrator hire an applicant if the applicant's criminal history record shows that the applicant has been convicted of one or more of the following offenses under Title, under Title 18 relating to criminal offenses or equivalent crimes under federal law or law of other states. On their list, there are 20 crimes that ban you from ever adopting a child or becoming a foster parent. Those crimes are criminal homicide, aggravated assault, stalking, kidnapping, unlawful restraint, rape, statutory sexual assault, involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, sexual assault, aggravated indecent assault, indecent insult, indecent exposure, incest, concealing the death of a child, endangering the welfare of a child, dealing in infant children, getting a felony offense for promoting prostitution, 
and then section C and D of section 5903 relating to any distribution of obscene and other sexual materials and performances. Corruption of minors, and last but not least, sexual abuse. Those are all 20 crimes that says that if you are convicted of those crimes, you will permanently be banned from ever adopting or fostering a child. And then finally in section three, it states that in no case shall an administrator hire an applicant if the applicant's criminal history records indicates that the applicant has been convicted of the felony offense under Act of April 14, 1972, known as the Controlled Substance, Drug, Device, and Cosmetic Act within a five-year five period, five period. So now I went over the overview of what the section was, then I dived into what the section, subsection C was, but now I'm gonna get into what I believe the problem was. So in Pennsylvania, there are about 2,522 foster children in the Pennsylvania child care system. Adoption provides children with a lifetime of emotional and legal connection to a family. Foster children who cannot return home risk, risk reaching adulthood without a permanent family of their own. Now, may, some of you may not know, but foster care was intended to be temporary, but for many Pennsylvania children, it remain, they remain in care for years. Older children in Pennsylvania are not likely to be adopted as younger children. In 2010, 961 youth in Pennsylvania aged out of foster care without a permanent legal family. 1,590, 80% of children in foster care ages nine and older in Pennsylvania had case, had case goals of long-term foster care or emancipation. These youth, are, these youth are at risk of aging out of foster care without a legal connection to permanent family. Now, I stated those facts because it shows that many children in Pennsylvania are in dire need of homes, whether in foster care or whether in an adopted family. And with the legislative presenting and with the laws of the requirements, a lot of people may be disqualified because of a mistake they made in the past, probably when they were 18 or young, well, 18, 19, 20, et cetera. So while I believe people must face the consequences of their action if they commit some of those crimes listed, as the old saying goes, if you do the crime, you do the time. However, what happens when someone is punished for a crime and faced with unreasonable consequences? So let's go back to the list of offenses. Like I stated, the 20 list is homicide and rape and sexual assault and incest and many more. And I must admit, a lot of those crimes on that list are very, very extreme. But there were three particular offenses that I saw that I believe were unfairly judged. Indecent exposure, providing obscene and other sexual materials and performances, and aggravated assault. And as a result, I want to remove them from the list of bans. Now, by removing them, I'm not saying that they should not be, uh, they should not be penalized. However, I want to suggest a certain time frame in which they are penalized. So in addition to the three sections I've already presented in the legislation, I decided to add four more sections to the legislation, which are sections four, sections five, and sections six and seven. The new sections categorized will add newly offenses under certain time frames, but also include the three offenses that I removed from the original legislation into those time frames. So, the new one, section four, I decided to add a new criminal offense, which is driving under the influence. Section four states that in no case shall an applicant be approved if the applicant has been convicted of a felony offense of driving under the influence of alcohol or, constr or controlled substance on three or more occasions within previous five years. And already by law in Title 75, it says that if you obtain three or more DUIs anyway, you will be convicted up to maybe one year in prison. And when I looked at it and I realized that it was included in the original legislation, I think it should be because nowadays, looking at some of the statistics, alcohol, in 2010, the alcohol-related deaths were 35% of the total traffic deaths. 459 people died in alcohol-related crashes. 91% of the alcohol-related occupants' deaths were, were in the vehicle driven by the drunken driver, and 75% were the drunken drivers themselves. So when I did research, 